Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hey, Rich, how you doing? Hey, guy, I'm doing well, man. How's, uh, your, how's your day go? Good, just seems like I just saw you. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, just spent the weekend in San Antonio. I know a lot of you all were there at the AADSM meeting, and uh, it was a long but good meeting uh, for us at DS3 and uh, a lot of our members we saw there. So I want to say hi to, to everyone again. Uh, thanks for coming up and saying hello and all the kind words too were, were, were fantastic. So uh, Rich, ready to get started talking about a step-by-step -step approach and forging physician relationships today? You bet. That's one of my favorite things, Guy. This is what I sure do a lot of this. Well, let's talk about one of my favorite things ourselves to start with. <laughs> The reason I put this slide in here is, is you know, Rich and I have been doing this a long time, about 20 years each, so pushing 40 years between us, I would think. And we've been in, I would guess, thousands of dental uh, medical offices by now, talking to physicians, and uh, Rich even more so than myself. So he's going to, I'm going to let him, uh, I, I promise to try to let you talk a little bit more this time, Rich. But, uh, you know, we go to these offices and we get the same pushback, we get the same hurdles that you all feel. And I know some of you said, well, it's probably easier for you because you've been doing it this long. And it's true, but at one point we we didn't have this behind us and we didn't have all the experience and we didn't have the, the confidence. And I think to start off today, we'd like to just quote a, a couple of our uh, well, presidents, Roosevelt. And, and if you do nothing more, Rich, walk in there with your confidence. There's nothing, What's they're not gonna bite you. I mean, it's not, the, you know, there's nothing to fear here. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to walk out of there and go, well, I, I, I can't get that hour or two of my life back. Has, any, has anyone ever accosted you or done anything worse than that, Rich, when you walk in there? Not yet. And <laughs> okay. I've, I've said some things I probably shouldn't have said. So. Oh, I know you have, knowing you as I have. I do. <laughs> Uh, yes, but, so. but yeah, you're right. You, you, I, I think, I think if you just took one thing away from this tonight, that would be it, wouldn't it, guy? You need to walk in there with confidence, and you need to realize the reason you can be confident is, well, quote the other uh, President Roosevelt here that that you, you speak softly and carry a big stick. And what do we mean by that? Well, dental devices work. So you're not walking in there unarmed. You're not walking in there without some sort of ammunition here to fight off the, the naysayers and the, and the things that they're gonna, they're gonna throw at you because dental devices work. The problem is they don't know that necessarily that they work. And so our job when we walk into these physicians' offices are to accept that they're probably good people. They just don't know what they don't know. I mean, there's some of them that aren't good people, I suppose, just like everyone else. But in general, Rich, wouldn't you say you walk in and, and the biggest hurdle we have is the gap, the knowledge gap that we have between what we know works and what, what we know in, in dental sleep medicine and what they don't know. I think you're hitting the nail on the head there, Guy. You know, I do this three or four or five times every single week and everybody goes, yeah, right, sure you do. But we do, every single week, I'm getting in front of three or four or five offices. And probably every other office guy, I hear, wow, I had no idea that you could do this as a dentist. Right. I had no idea that these things were as accepted as they are or that they work or that they're covered by medical insurance or that, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. And, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about to, tonight is, is the types of questions that they ask. And we want to really give you guys some meat and potatoes kind of uh, verbiage that you can use when they ask these questions. So we're, we're going to get into this pretty, pretty detailed. And I think you're really going to get something out of this tonight. Yeah. And I think when we, when we talk about, that these work and that what they have to offer. and We have these discussions. If we'll just keep the patient's best interest in the forefront, th these conversations go well. Because they may say something, well, what about CPAP here? Or what about this? Or what about that? And, and, and don't, you know, that doesn't ever offend me. Don't go, oh no, we don't want to talk about CPAP. We don't want to talk about other treatment alternatives. We want to talk about anything with that physician that can help more of our patients breathe better, sleep better, live longer. And if we keep that in mind and we keep redirecting the conversation to helping the patients and we have our confidence, 
and we know we have a solution that works many times for many, many patients, not all of them, but lots of the patients, and we believe in what we're doing, the conversations, uh, really, it's, it's not about all the rest of the stuff I want to tell you about. It's not how articulate you are. It's not about um, a lot of the things that I think you fear. Uh, it, 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 it really comes together, and so I... I think you know you can probably turn off the webinar now and go out and meet your physicians because if you get if you get that information, uh, that's the the brux of it. We're going to give you some detailed things about what to say, what to bring, what to expect, but that's the gist of what you have to have. And uh, I guess the first thing you can pull out in your bag of uh, of instruments or arrows you can bring in your uh, was it quiver or whatever the thing is you put them in. Yeah, I got the right mm -hmm. word there. Is that we know now that dental devices work as well as CPAP when we're considering the mean disease alleviation calculation. Uh, in other words, if you hand someone a CPAP or a dental device and we're trying to make them overall more healthy, they work equally, not according to Guy Yatros, not according to Rich Drake. According to whom? The American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine as of 2015. And part of that is the reason is that as many as uh, eighty-three percent of the patients find that they can't wear the CPAP, and I think when when you're talking to your doctors, this is what they don't get, isn't it? They say, "Well, CPAP's gold standard; it works, and it always works." You, did they ever tell you that, Rich? Oh, I, I would. There's a lot of things that they don't get, but this is certainly up at the top, you know. Uh -huh. And you, let me let me let me talk about just a couple of things that you said there, Guy. Um, you know, we talked about the confidence, and Dr. Bowser's on the questions guy put in there too, that there's nothing more powerful than a common cause. So, you know, one of the things that I like to say, Guy, is, you know, you, you certainly don't want the, 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 the tone of the meeting to be confrontational about whether a patient should use CPAP or the dental device. That if it starts off that way, you're better off looking at your phone and going, oh, my God, uh, there's something there's some kind of an emergency. I have to go and just leave and then come back and try it another day, you know, literally. But, you know, we don't we don't discourage patients from using CPAP in my office. I never have. I, we just got to figure out what works best for, for each patient. And. That might not be the same for you as it is for me. You know, the people that use CPAP, they love it, and they don't understand why anybody else, why everybody else doesn't feel that way. The problem is that's only about one in three patients. You know, what, what do we do for the other ones, you know? And, and then we, we just kind of back into how we're doing, you know, and we're going to get into that a little bit more. But right now we're still talking about the, the arrows in your quiver, so to speak, uh, to help give you some confidence. It's not like... You have this new blood pressure drug guy that's never been given to anybody, but you're pretty sure it's going to work. You know, we're not selling that. We're we're talking about something that has a lot of uh, peer-reviewed, randomized control trials behind it, and it, it, we don't doubt that anymore. But I think you have to get through their head for sure that th this would be like you prescribing a blood pressure pill that the patient only takes every third or fourth day. Mm -hmm. I, I said that the other day and this, this lady That's goes, That's great, oh. I've, never, I've never heard you say so that. that, I don't like it. That, 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 that wouldn't be too good, you know, because now I'm, I'm doing this kind of thing. And, and I think maybe, you know, there might be a little few things like that that you can stay, but you know, when, when our devices don't always work quite as well as CPAP, which I think is probably true most of the time, then we have to be extra, extra diligent about making sure that the patient wears their dental device. Because that's a lot of what we're hanging our hat on, is that they will wear it. So we, we have to be extra careful that, that that's what we're doing. But when we look at this mean disease alleviation calculation, this is very powerful stuff. You know, our, our device, if, if it only works 70% as well, and that's not true, sometimes it's better, but the patient will wear it all the time as compared to somebody who only wears CPAP half the time, then we're, the patient's really better off. And if you can get that through your head, through their head, I, I, I think we made a big step because that's how a lot of them look when you walk in, isn't it, Guy? Yeah, and, and most of them don't know anything about this. And I tell you, it's not their fault. Uh, I think we kind of get annoyed at the physicians. We get 
uh, upset, and it's because they weren't taught it in medical school. Uh, no one else has educated them. It's not even in the public. Did anybody see? I don't know if this is the National. This is the New York Times article. It's today's paper. I don't know if you can see that. Sleep apnea. Uh -huh. Okay, it's all this page and a half page on the back. Okay, that was today's paper. I can get the date up there. I don't know if I can see the date, but it doesn't matter. Take my word on it. Anyway, all that whole page and a half talks about why apnea is bad for you. It gives old statistics that haven't been true for 15 years. A lot of other misinformation then tells you can treat it with CPAP if that doesn't work you can have a surgery if that doesn't work you can try this thing called an inspire uh, that moves the tongue forward all these things and there's one sentence in and it doesn't even call it a mandibular advancement device they say a jaw splint that may hold the jaw forward one sentence out of that whole article that, that was in the paper today about mandibular advancement devices and that's what we're up against uh, educating these physicians and again it's not their fault here's a man that's a considered the father of sleep that's his nickname and his quote is the diagnosis and treatment of sleep disorders in primary care medicine today is essentially zero they don't know anything about it so i know rich one of your big things now is you're you 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 do a lot of lunch and learns you do more primary cares than anybody or, or at least as many right uh, that's our main target these days. And and why is that? It's because 70% of my referrals come from primary care physicians. And that's changed from just three years ago. Uh, so we're starting to see that change. We're starting to see a lot more primary care physician offices doing their own home sleep testing now. They're getting more comfortable with uh, the diagnostic side of it, and they're getting more comfortable with managing it. They found that there are a few codes that they can bill for. and I think in general, Guy, uh, primary care docs probably, uh, you know, care more about their patients' overall health. You know, they're not a they're not a specialist. It's not like, hey, guy, your knee's getting bone on bone. We got to do your knee. You know, it's 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 the whole thing. So well, they're with them for a lifetime, lots of times, for many years. Mm -hmm. They keep coming back. They have deeper relationships, much like like we do with our patients. And one of the things yes. we want to get across when we talk to our uh, our primary cares or any of the physicians we're going to talk about tonight is when we talk to the American Academy, when we look rather at the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, their practice parameters. So the physicians group that, that, that makes statements about how we should treat this serious disorder called disruptive sleep apnea, they give two first line of therapy treatments. Not all those other things that listed in the paper I just flew, threw away here on the floor. They list CPAP and they list dental devices. Those are the two treatments that the primary cares you're talking to, we're talking to, and hopefully you all will be talking to, need to know that's the treatment. That's the first line of therapy, not these other things. And these other things have a place, but we don't you know, do a radical knee replacement, using your analogy, uh, for every knee problem. We, we start off with the more conservative treatments and what is it with in line, and this is it. And I think either the the physicians don't know or they have their heads in the sand uh, and, and maybe they don't even know they have their heads in the sand because they're so busy, their money, their reimbursements are going down. They're having to see more patients to pay their bills. We as dentists make more money than, than primary cares do now as a, a general dentist versus a primary care. So, I mean, you got to almost feel bad for these guys in some ways that, that, that they just need help. And if they grant you the time to talk to them, to us, we need to make sure that's valuable. And Rich, this has been your mantra since I've known you. So I'll let you talk about your slide here. Yeah, so what do we think, Guy, about 175,000 or so dentists in the United States? Yeah, I so think so. Right. Uh, let's say we could get half of them, just half to pay attention to the airway. By the way, the American Dental Association a year and a half ago said that you will start screening your patients for sleep disordered breathing. And I'll bet today not one in 10 dentists uh, does that. I'm pretty sure that everybody on this webinar does or you wouldn't be on this webinar. But let's go back to if we just get half of them to do it. And we just took the time out of our week to visit two doctors a week, 50 weeks out of the year. That's 100 uh, physicians. And, and if 50,000 dentists even did that guy, that, that's a big number, you right. know, within, within one or two years, every single physician in the United States would have 
have had at least a talk of what we're talking about doing. That's why you're here. You're talking about, okay, what do we talk about? What questions are they asked? What are we going to do? But you said it. I, I think you said it before, guy. They don't know what they don't know. Right. You know, it's it's not so much maybe that their head's in the sand as much as they have to know an awful lot about an awful lot of things. And it it it's it's almost like this whole sleep thing is so mundane. You know, oh, eat right, get a good night's rest, you know, and get some exercise. We're right. we're going to be saying that a hundred thousand years from now to our patients, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's just boring. But but we can actually start to move the needle here. And and I, t I say this all the time. It's just a numbers game. You know, I walked into guy in on two consecutive days. I had one of the best lunch and learns I've ever been to. And the next day I had one of the worst ones I had ever been to. <laughs> you know, the first one, they were engaged. They asked questions. They sat there for a full hour, one hour. And, and the, the receptionist is going, Dr. Drake, Dr. Yatros, the patients are stacking up out in the waiting room there. Well, hold on a minute. You know, I want to, I have one more question for this guy, you know, so they're doing that. And the very next day I went in there and after a little while, I thought, I'm just going to stop talking. I'm going to see how long it takes for somebody to notice that I quit talking. And I probably quit talking for a minute, guy. And then one of the guys, oh, is something wrong? I said, well, I have a question for you guys, yeah? I said, is it a prerequisite for you guys to take like maybe 10 milligrams of Valium before you come in here and listen to me? <laughs> he said that. And I, I still didn't get hit. I didn't get a cost. Uh, but that, there you have it. There you have it. The, one of the best and one of the worst, you know, right. and they were on back-to-back -back days. But it's a numbers game, you know, you... You have to be confident, you have to know the message, and you have to be persistent and, persistent. and persevere because some of them get it, some of them don't. Right. And it's a numbers game. Yeah, so I see some questions coming in. We're going to talk about that, about that in a minute, but feel free to type questions in the questions box. We will get to all of them. Rich, you're, you're an expert at this. Now, I haven't done a whole lot of breakfast and learns. I think that's a really great idea because you can probably get to the doctors before they start going behind, getting behind. Uh, yeah. And then you and then you do you do lunch and learns and do you have any tricks for us on on either one of those is specifically what to bring or what to, to how to set those up as far as the food goes? Yeah, it's a good question and that's a a very pertinent question. So you know, for breakfast stuff, we we usually get fruit and bagels and uh, you know some yogurt and granola, uh, coffee and juice. You know, for lunch we take some kind of sandwich or wrap, a chicken salad or a, or a, you know, like a spinach wrap. We take a big tray of fruit, we take a big tray of vegetables and we take a big salad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we got over a long time ago, guy, well, you know, we really like Ruth's Chris, right. uh, you know, <laughs> for lunch and, you know, Dr. Smith has a gluten allergy and, you know, doctor, we don't take orders anymore. You know, right. we, we just we just go, hey, you get what you get. And when we book those, the marketing person that I hire, she says, what time can right. we expect 50 percent or more of the providers to be there so that Dr. Drake can have five minutes with them? If we're going to provide you with lunch, then we want five minutes with 50 percent or more of the providers. Because a lot of the practices we go to, guy, have, you know, five primary cares, two right. nurse practitioners, and two PAs. So, you know, if you start out that way, and then you, t you know, I don't think, you know, maybe for an office where we're going to feed 30 people, we might spend 120 bucks or something like that. But we just go to the local grocery store to the deli, right. and you can get sandwiches just like that and cut them up and um, the vegetable tray and salad and stuff like that. I mean, it sounds, but it don't, sounds don't simple, over, but, but the first time you, you do it, 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 you realize it, it's not. And the, the other key thing is, is uh, as you get busy as a dentist, uh, you get the team there early. With what time do you want this set up? Someone else can set uh -huh. that up. You go back, exactly. they usually have a lounge, take cups and all that stuff or whatever, you know, so they're ready. And then what Rich said, I'm going to reiterate that. Basically, you're trying to find out what time the doctors can commit to being there. And then that's when we, the, the dentists, want to show up because 
you know, it, it, we don't want to spend two hours of our time waiting on setting up food and waiting for the people to come in. Uh, have someone there who knows what they're talking about, can answer some questions, and then try yes. to minimize the doctor time. And that, that's worth the price of this well, webinar. It cost anything, so it's certainly worth, <laughs> worth the price of this webinar. But I learned that from you, and I was wasting a lot of my time by uh -huh. going for the whole time, and that's really not necessary. Have one of your team members there who's, uh, who's capable, and then the doctor could, could kind of roll in. Uh, when they are assuming the other doctor, I try to get there before the doctor's supposed to be there and certainly allow a little bit of time afterwards. Uh, but I think we're beating up the, the logistics, but the logistics make you feel more comfortable. If you walk in and all that's going well, but if you walk in and you're late and we don't have plates and all that, now you're feeling uncomfortable. It's like walking yeah. into an operatory without the equipment out. It, it, it really can lead to that feeling of insecurity, which is what we've been talking about for the first part of this webinar. A little bit of housekeeping here too, just uh, uh, to, to, before we get into the details of, of what you say and what you bring. The next uh, webinar will be uh, Tuesday, July 9th. This is exciting. I don't think we've done this one in a while mm -hmm. or ever, so it's gonna, I got some work ahead of me, I guess, to put this thing together, but I know it'll be exciting. Uh, we got digital scans, CBCTs, uh, talk about oh, pharyngometry, whatever there is out there digitally, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what you use and what you don't use use and why we use it uh, in, in a dental sleep world. And that's an exciting time uh, uh, with, with what's going on. And, uh, and, and, and we'll talk about, you know, we'll talk about that digital workflow from the other side too. You right. know, some of the things that the, some of the labs are doing now to that's true. kind of yes. meet, meet us halfway. So that, you know, we'll talk about that from a couple of different angles. I think it'll be really good. Digital workflow and some of the new digital devices like the ProSomnus there on the left with uh, the CAD CAM designs uh, and how those have changed. Uh, our workflow from saving time to extending the life of the devices uh, for our patients. Absolutely, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, you will get CE for this if you if uh, you stay for the uh, until uh, for the hour. Uh, we will answer all your questions. Keep putting them in uh, as we go. If you don't get the CE, check your spam folder. Uh, if it's not there within 72 hours, then feel free to contact us. Uh, we've already kind of told you who we were. Uh, just the one thing we didn't mention is Rich and I started. Dental Sleep Solutions about 11 years ago with truly the sole desire to get more dentists helping more patients. And I don't know about you, Rich, but I had at least a half dozen people come up to me personally at, in San Antonio last weekend telling me how through what we have taught them that they have helped thousands of patients' uh, lives. And, and it, it really, really made me feel like at times we feel like we're treading water here and not, not, not keeping our head above it, but it really made me feel feel good about what we do with our team and we help with the, what we call the four pillars, screening, testing, treating, and billing. And we do that through a whole team of uh, DS3 uh, member support experts who help you with education. They're there to help coach you. We have the best cloud-based EMR uh, dental sleep software available. And then we're right there for support for questions that you may have. Tomorrow night, I will be doing an online study club meeting for just our members. I've got, I think eight or 10 questions submitted well, we will be going through those in a, in, a, in, a, in a study club fashion. So if you want to know more about what we do, or even if you just have a question about dental sleep that, you, that we can't get to here that's not related to the, the topic, just type in consultation. And one of our member support team, Brandy, Jody, Mike, someone will get back with you, answer your question, spend as much time as you need to feel comfortable with, with that. And then we can tell you how we can take your uh, dental sleep practice to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the next level. Um, we do a lot of uh, two-day courses. Uh, we're adding a few more on here. Uh, I see we have the one in St. Augustine. We have a premier study club meeting for our members, which is free but open uh, for our members, but op open to the public. One in Cleveland. I know we're adding a few more on those. And uh, Rich, every time we do this, you you say that you know our course for about a thousand dollars, you get a sleep device, a dental sleep device. You get a sleep test for you a day and a, uh, two days for you and your team, 14 hours of CE. And for $1,000, then we take off the 200 as we have, uh, which we do for these courses. If you just type in course now, um, that's that's worth the worth, worth it in the sleep test and the dental device, right? I think that's what you usually say. It's the it's the cheapest way I know to get diagnosed and treated. That's for dang sure. Yeah. So if you're listening out there and you think you might have sleep apnea, you might need a dental device. If you did, you know, that's the cheapest way to get that done. But, you know, if if you haven't done that, I would encourage you to do that because, uh, you know, Guy teaches most of these courses, and y'all need to get to see Guy. He, uh, he, he's good at making things simple. He's good at breaking things down. 
that's what we try to do is to try to create protocols and systems for how to break this down into little little steps and what you do and and you know he's good at motivating your team too and you, you can't we can't stress enough those of you who who bring your teams consistently are more successful than those of you who don't I, is that fair to say guy it's fair to say and uh, like i said we'll be adding more so check our website i know we've got a few in the works for the fall that we just haven't finalized uh and I, you, you've got my promise that you will leave that course with the information that you need to go back and begin treating patients the next week in your office. I can tell you that no other course offers a uh, nuts and bolts how you do this in your practice like we do. Uh, you, you've got uh, my commitment to that, our commitment to that. Uh, and I, I've said that to thousands of people that attend our course. I've never had anybody come up afterwards and go, well, I, I, I didn't get the information I needed here. Uh, there's, uh, it's a real cookbook of, of information we'll give you. Uh, and then kind of totally different, Rich, uh, well, you all got rave reviews for your advanced course. So I know a lot of people on this webinar, uh, some, we have some beginners. We got over a hundred people on here tonight. It looks like, uh, we have the advanced course. When's that coming up in the fall again, I guess, the date up there, yeah, October 24th. Yeah. Yeah. Towards the end of October. So, uh, I, I would, I would caution you, uh, probably, you know, you need to make, I don't know, guy, what do you think? 30, 40 devices probably or so. Uh, maybe not that many, that. but maybe a dozen or two, I would think. Would, yeah. Would you, right. Yeah. So be, be careful, you know, don't, don't jump into that. It's not that it's over your head, but it's, you know, and what we talk about in that course are some of the things like we're talking about right here, right now. You know, we, we we open it up. We let people ask, uh, hey, what do you guys want to learn about? We try to keep that class to about 25, which is a really great size for learning. But we do a lot of hands-on stuff where we take bites and we deliver devices and we do my taps and we, we have uh, CPAP machines there that you can do and you can put put your dental device in. You can feel how the CPAP changes, you know, because we talk about, a lot about combination therapy. So. Uh, it's just and, good stuff. And marketing. I know that Mark Fowler's there. I yeah. see his name. He's a wonderful, uh, can't say enough nice things about him. So uh, I, I can tell you, I looked at your reviews, Rich, and they were all fives. The last few you've done, everybody was very happy they, they did that. Uh, then uh, last thing, and, and uh, again, if you want a course, just type in course for that discount, consult, consult for this. And then uh, this, I had to say, I had, I don't know if there's 100 people said something to me, but I bet it was pushing that. Uh, last weekend about how wonderful our, our meeting that Jason Tierney has spearheaded and uh, has really made just a, a, a it's, it's just a buzz. The North American Dental Sleep Medicine Symposium, this will be our fourth fourth year in doing it. Every year, we, uh, I don't know how Jason does it, but we get even better speakers. You can see the see the, the, the list of, uh, of people in front of you, uh, besides Rich and myself. Jameson Spencer is going to be there this year. Uh, I always mispronounce his name, Jills Levine, I think is the way I, I, I said it right, hopefully this time, mm -hmm. but I've heard him speak a bunch of times. He's, you know, well, well respected. Uh, my panky, uh, my panky mentor, Mark Murphy, and is also the uh, dental clinical director for ProSomnus. And we've, we've got tons of people on here that are just, uh, Steve Carson's from the Panky Institute too, and speaks a lot for the ADA. One hour courses, this is all you need to do to do something in your office. They're all very practical. So uh, the only disclaimer I'm gonna make each year, the rooms will sell out. It's in Clearwater Beach uh, on, in February. The rooms are 269, I think they are. Uh, and if you wait till January, they'll be double that probably. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll plan ahead. That. Plan ahead because we get a bunch of calls in January, February every year. Why can't I get the 269 room? All right. so. How are we going to find these referral sources, Rich? You, you've hired how many days a week is she working now? Uh, we have a full-time uh, marketing person who works for uh, three days a week at my office. Okay. And, uh, you know, that, that person needs to be a very organized person. You know, whatever uh, contact management program you know something about, we happen to use High Rise. I don't own any part of High Rise. I don't make any money off of that. It uh, just happens to be the one that we use. And so we know who is the referral coordinator at which office, who's the front office, you know, so we keep notes on these people when we call them. And, and she's just good at getting past the gatekeeper, so to speak, you know, because, you, you know, and, and we'll, we'll talk to anybody, Guy. You know, um, we went and did a, a lunch and learn guy 
for a group of doctors who are doing dialysis for their kidney patients. Who, would that be high on your list? No. I mean, it, did, it didn't make our short list here, right. but in two weeks, we've already had three referrals from those doctors. Wow. You know, so the, the point is, you know, we just, we just don't know. Those doctors play golf with somebody else, you know. So I, I love the part, anyone who talks a lot, you know, when we, yeah. we talk about finding uh, all of these things. But I want to say you don't have to hire someone three days a week to start with for this. No. Currently in my office, I have uh, my office managers uh, doing a lot of this. We are looking for somebody part-time because I had somebody previously. But this can be your office manager. It can be one of your assistants. It can be anybody who's organized can spearhead this. And if you're not that busy yourself and you're trying to build your sleep practice, you just start your own dental office and you've got your own spare time, it could be anybody to do sure. this. Uh, it just someone needs to not be afraid of uh, of rejection. And um, when it comes to, 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 to talking to these people, um, you know, you can send them out on scouting missions, uh, you know, just cold calling places. You can, you can do lunch and learns, uh, which uh, not just for physicians, you can do those at Awake Clubs, Rotary Club. Awake's a, a CPAP um, uh, support group, and they have them throughout mm -hmm. the country. If you Google that, you might find that there's one in your area, and they're always looking for someone to speak. You can sponsor. I tell you, you're having a booth at a medical meeting. You can meet a ton of people, just like you have them in your dental meeting. You can pay a few hundred bucks and be at their medical meetings uh, talking about, just talk about it. When people say, what are you doing these days? Well, I treat a lot of patients with snoring and apnea. I will tell you, Rich, almost every time I take an Uber when I'm speaking, the yeah. Uber driver says, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm here giving a talk. You're talking about what? Sleep apnea and dental devices. I give them a card, and I almost always find one of our, we have DS3 members in all 50 states, and I almost always find one of our members of patients just because I opened my mouth. And, and said this well, is that's what I'm funny, guys. I, I had two DS3 members tell me that from the airport to the hotel at the AADSM meeting, they got me two patients. Yeah, I they, heard that. They just, hey, I'm going to a sleep meeting. What sleep meeting? What's that? You know, so, right. you know, that's the nice thing about this the meeting being in your own hometown. <laughs> you get more yeah. referrals. And what most of you have the, in your gold mine there, and you don't realize it, is you have your own patients. They trust you. Uh, they'll they'll do fee for service. We could talk about billing. We do a whole hour of billing, but you know they, they, they will they will 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 say yes to treatment because you're you're already getting them to do pay you to hurt them to fill teeth that they don't see, right? I mean, my goodness, you can get them to pay you to breathe at night as well. And if you can do this, and once you treat them, you need to communicate with their medical caregivers. It's not just for marketing; it's your obligation. Uh, if you if you your your periodontist treats a patient of yours, he needs to communicate with you. Well, if you're the 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 dentist and you're treating this patient, the primary cares, all their doctors. If they have a, uh, a dermatologist, even I'm going to include them in the letters that we send. We make that real easy for those of you who who don't know what DS3 is. It's a cloud-based EMR that helps with management of uh, all of our patient data, and it makes it real easy to write these letters. But regardless of how easy it is, if you will just commit to saying, I'm going to treat this patient, I'm going to find out who all their doctors that they see, and I'm going to send them a letter when we begin treatment, a letter when we may be in the middle of treatment somewhere, and a letter uh, at the end of treatment. Uh, and then when we're all finished with that, I'm going to get on the phone and communicate with the, that physician and, and, and say, hey, I sent all the letters, we finished the treatment. I, I, you know, here's where their AHI was before and after, their symptoms, chief complaint, whatever you want to talk about, and say, can I talk to Dr. Jones, call their primary care up or whichever doctor you want to, to talk to, and say, I would like to speak to them about this patient. And they may be busy, fine. Say, can I make an appointment to speak with them about our mutual patient? And then I gave this advice to one of our DS3 members this, this weekend. She was like, I can't get through the, do the doctors. They're in these big, huge groups. Well, if you're mm -hmm. treating a patient, Hopefully, they'll have enough um, patient care integrity to get on the phone to speak with you. Talk about the patients. Talk about the treatment. Ask them, is there anything else I could have done better here to better treat your patient you want to see me do, be do differently? Now, that may be, no, we did fine click. Or it might be, oh, my gosh, I didn't even know there was such a thing. 
as these dental devices. This is wonderful. Can you tell me more? Or maybe somewhere in between. You've got to gauge that conversation. But I can tell you it's more often the latter two than the first one. And if, the, if you see sense and opportunity from that, then uh, talk to the, uh, to the doctor's office about, well, can I come by and bring you some more information? Can we sit down and, and talk about this? Maybe I can bring you breakfast or lunch someday. And that is, to me, the best way uh, to get your foot through the door without having to go hire a marketing uh, person like, like, like Rich has to start with. When you get busy enough, it certainly, certainly makes sense. So uh, I think the backbone of yeah, this, because, if you want, go, because go we can be doing a lot of that ourselves, Guy. You're absolutely right. right. You know, you do that. You know, we, you, we cannot over, over uh, stress the importance of the letter writing, though. Right. You know, most dentists write two or three letters a year. Uh, you don't have your your letters need to be short. They need to be to the point. The patient showed up. The patient didn't show up. We're treating the patient. We're not treating the patient. They're doing well. We're still adjusting it. Whatever. But you, you know, you just cannot stress that enough because that probably is one of our strongest marketing things that we do, guy. Because we're constantly kind of staying in front of these people. They, oh yeah, they do Drake, another letter from Drake. Oh, he's right. seeing guy. Okay. You know, if, if it's more than three or four sentences, I doubt they're going to read it. I, I love the four and five and six page letters that you dentists like to write, but you're the only one that reads them. Nobody <laughs> else reads them out there. I promise you that. Sure. Um, you know, and we hear physicians say all the time, guy, don't tell me something that I already know about my own patient. Right. So the only thing we put in DS3 is, hey, I'm calling about our mutual patient, Guy Yatros, had a sleep study, he was diagnosed with this. That's all we do to make that introduction. But you're, you're right, Guy, pick up the phone, call. Um, you can talk to uh, nurse practitioners, PA. You can even talk to referral coordinators. If you can't get the doctor on the right. phone, talk to the referral coordinator and say, hey, I know you're talking with the doc all day, every day. Let us know how, how, how you think this went. You know, uh, we, we thought it went great, that we had a great result, the patient's happy. Right. Now, now, Guy, we're actually going to walk into a physician's office. Let's talk yeah. about that. And we're going to get in a little more granular in a second, but at a high level, uh, I want to learn about what it is they do there. You know, let's don't go, I've been backing up, before you walk through the door, it's not about me. It's about them, us, and then me maybe put me at the bottom of our practice. Our goal is to learn about them, learn what they don't, what they know, what they do with their sleep patients, what do they know about dental sleep. Let them understand what we know about dental sleep. So it's not that, that we're trying to get a patient, we're just trying to let them under, that, that statement by um, uh, Dr. Dement, they don't know anything about this stuff and we're there to help them, giving them some free information uh, and we can talk about specifics how you do it. I want to leave with an agreement of if we are going to treat your patients, how do you want me to do that? And that may be different for each uh, each physician. Some of them want us to do sleep tests. Some some of uh, other patients, other physicians rather want them to come back. Some of us want to. There's just all varying th ways that we can we can uh, we can do things and uh, how do the, how even the handoff is. We want to talk about too the referring protocol. Uh, do I want to them just to call me? Ideally, and, and the, the, this is a really important part, if I can get them to agree to take this piece of paper with my name on it, put their patient's name on it, and fax it to us, the, the benefit to the physician is if you will do that and tell the patient you're going to do that, we will contact that patient. And you're going to get a letter from me if the patient never comes in. So that way you won't think you referred them to me and they and and I didn't call them because sometimes they give us give them our number and they never call it you know they 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 don't call us and we don't even know that they gave them our name and they think we dropped the ball so I would much rather physician uh, fax something to me I have the patient's name and number that way if somehow the patient doesn't follow through they know I I I certainly tried so yeah for for us guy that's not even an option anymore okay you know we 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 just tell them. Look, you, if I don't know that you made that referral, I, I can't, you know, I mean, how many times do we go, hey, you know, you should see that ENT. And then you right. see the ENT and play golf with them and go, man, I referred you five people last week. Really? Well, none of them showed up. What were their names? You know, how they do that. So, but, but you're right as far as, and make that go both ways. You know, when, when we make a referral to you, 
Absolutely. How do you want us? How do you want us to do that? Do you have a form that we can use? Do you have this or that? So, like you said, it's it's going both ways. You know, the the thing I like too, what you said there, guy, was you know when you ask about their practice and what they're doing, I, I also like to ask. After we hear that, I ask, how do you typically handle the process of getting the patient sleep tested? Right, that's a big part. You know, so that's the next question, and we're kind of getting into that now. But you know, I think more than anything, you know, um, be be confident. You know, you're going to hear us say that a lot tonight. So uh, we talked about the details: who's going to order the food, who's going to pick the food up. We have a cart guy a little cart that sits in the corner in my office and somebody's responsible for making sure it has plates and napkins and forks and spoons and cups and you know the, the box of all the sample dental devices and all that stuff so we, we make sure that you know you get the details of all of that stuff down because it takes a lot of that stress away of of this so that's all part of it yeah establish the details of the meeting sometimes they don't want food sometimes the doctor says you know what you know, I can give you five minutes with the doctor and that's that. And sometimes I'll go in and just meet the doctor. That's fine too. So know what you're doing. And if it's a huge room, there's a hundred doctors. I'm, I'll bring a, and I ask them, do you have a TV? Do you have a projector? Cause I like, I like to just to talk if it's anywhere under 15 or so people, but when you get the big groups, sometimes it's better to have a PowerPoint or something that everybody can see. So you want to know that ahead of time and you want to arrive on time. That means your team before you typically and the doc and me as a dentist arrive. But for sure, don't say the doctor's going to be there at 12 to 12.15 and schedule a patient at 12.30 because they're going to run late almost always. Leave a buffer at the end for you and your team because physicians, guess what? Uh, I, I think they've run late on occasion, at least my experience when I go to their offices. Uh, you may have to wait a few moments, so just, just go ahead and expect that. Uh, the things we're going to bring, we got a whole list of stuff here, uh, and uh, the, here's Rich carrying his kitchen sink. No, it's not Rich, but you know, you you can bring everything but the kitchen sink if you want to. Um, I, I like the idea, Rich. I don't have a a box. I'm gonna we're, I'm writing that down for myself right there to have a you know container, some something that we put all this in. But I think I'm gonna take stuff in and out of it each time because I don't think I want to take everything I have for a couple of reasons. And we'll go through some of these on here. Uh, you can read them as we're talking uh, because number one is overwhelming. So I want to know my audience a little bit. So what might be if it's my first meeting versus my 10th meeting. And the other is I want a reason to go back to them. You know, we ideally like to get in these offices every three, four months, at least a couple of times a year. And if I should give them all everything that I ever knew the first day I know, met them, first of all, they're not going to remember it. It's too much information. Number one, and number two, I don't have a reason to come back. Oh, the next time, you know what? I'd like to show you this study, doctor, that we we came across this uh, this New England uh, uh, medical journal study, or this new uh, CAD CAM uh, device, this this new mill uh, device that that we're that we're making for people, or or combination therapy, or something. Having another reason to go back. So you can see a list of things here. We're going to go through a few of these. Uh, anything you want to say about those? I think the, the first two no, or three we'll talk about in detail. That's that's a pretty big list. I'm glad you put confidence in there. You know, don't forget to bring your brain. Maybe you should add that one, Guy. Yes. Um, that confidence right there. I love <laughs> no. that picture, you know. Yeah. That's certainly what we need to feel like, you know, when we do this. And yes. that's very hard for those of you who are just getting into this. And and we, we feel your pain, uh, but you have to be able to, to uh, your your tolerance for rejection and risk and those types of things. I, I mean, I, I honestly think, Guy, if most dentists hired a therapist in their town just to deal with rejection, it would make them a better dental sleep medicine practitioner because you get a little bit of this. You know, people don't, oh, I don't really believe in that or I don't think you know what you're talking about. And you just, well, what, you know, how, how can I change that? You know, what can I show? Can I show you studies? What do you want to see? Do you want to see this? You want to see that? And you have to be, you have to be confident enough to, to, I think, guy to say, you know what? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll right. find out, but I'll right. find out for you. You know, I, I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me, right. you know, uh, that question before and I'll find out, but all of this stuff goes together, you know? So let's, let's talk about the things that you bring and what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think, again, inquire about their practice, about their knowledge, and we already hit that, but one of the things we want to talk about is is who is in charge here of what? 
So, you know, if, if you have a patient who's failing on CPAP, how do you know if they're failing on CPAP? Who's monitoring the CPAP? How do we know what their compliance is? Who's the one in the office that's doing that? And if they're having troubles, who's the one that talks to them about what to, where to go from there? That's the person you, you want to talk to. I mean, it may not be the doctor. I think the doctor has to be convinced because he's, he or she's the one that ultimately has to sign off on this. But the one that you want to be a really big buddy is the one who, who's um, the one on the ground level working with the patients who can't tolerate it. Because uh, I, when we talk about meeting with physicians, I would love to see the day, Rich, that we walk in and go, you know what? The practice parameters are anyone with apnea can have a dental device, no matter the, what level. That should be an alternative. The, the new practice parameters state that. More severe, maybe we should head towards CPAP, but that's not really what it says these days. Wouldn't it be nice if we walked in and all physicians would go, well, there's two treatment choices, and they go through the both, and, and they start referring us people with HIs of 20? Well, I don't discount that, and but don't make that your goal when you walk in the first day. Let's take baby steps, and let's just talk to them about the patients who are struggling with CPAP, because uh, getting them to refer us the AHIs of 20 uh, without trying CPAP first, even though it's a fantastic idea and we do it, we see those patients and we treat them well, uh, they're not going to be as comfortable with that as they are with the struggle with CPAP. So start there. And I do have offices now, Rich, I don't know about you, not a lot of them who will refer us patients with HIs of 15 to 20 uh, or so, even if they haven't tried CPAP because we're getting more comfortable with what we do uh, and, and the conversation that they may have with their patients. Hey guy, I never thought of this, but what do you think about putting a little, a little dog in your, your cart? You know, little little stuffed animal dog. So this, you know, this is Rover, and he he'll take the crumbs that you throw under the table. You know, <laughs> for the CPAP and talk. Put CPAP patient. in his mouth. <laughs> there we go. I like. Yeah, well, that's uh, back to Rich. We'll say whatever it comes to his mind at times, but he hasn't but been hit yet. Right. He haven't been, have been thrown out yet. So if, don't be afraid. But, if they haven't thrown Rich out, they're not going to throw you out. But you're right. You know, don't. Hey, you know, we treat patients with AHIs over 100 every day. The guys can go, what? What? Yeah. You know, yeah. Start with, hey, just start with the really mild cases. Start with the with the ones who can't tolerate CPAP. And again. How do we refer to you? What do you do? You know, but once we get past that, I like to just ask guy, can can you tell me what you know about this? Or would right. you like me just to kind of pretend like you don't know anything and tell you what I know? Right. And almost everybody says, just pretend like I don't know anything. You know, it kind of gives them a way to to not feel stupid or, you know, something like that. But yeah, I, I like what one of our uh, our team members, Mike, said today in one of our, our meetings is when we start talking about things, say, you know, all right, I'll explain this to you, but feel free to interrupt me if something I say doesn't make sense or you need clarification. Uh, it's kind of a permission statement, uh, something we learned in one of our team building meetings today, and I and I, I really like that. So, it's, you know, I'm going to try to start using that with my patients and with the doctors. Just stop me if, if not, but I'll go ahead and explain it to you. The things we have listed here, are probably the most common things that I take uh, with me, and we'll we'll go through a, a couple of them here. Device models, we're not going to go through those right now, but I always take a device model, no matter how many times I've been. Try to bring a different one each time or something, but just for sure, sure. the Hokuma study, I see a question about the Hokuma study. Uh, we have a team answering all your questions right now, and anything they can't answer, or you can see how competent our dental sleep medicine team is at DS3 because they're answering all the questions as we go through here. Uh, that's a book that we can take with us that, that really shows a great contrast between um, CPAP and dental devices and, and how they both both work well. Uh, Wisconsin Sleep Cohort, um, uh, we take the New England Medical Journal. The practice parameters, first, uh, uh, I almost always take, and the protocols uh, we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, this uh, Wisconsin Sleep Cohort, cohort uh, I use this all the time in my practice. We even print these out. And uh, I don't want to take a, a whole lot of times. A lot of you have seen it before. But the short version of this is this study has been done over 20 years on over 1,000 patients who are just given a sleep test about every seven years and evaluated. And if you can see, can you see my, my cursor there, Rich? Yes, I can. So these are the patients who had a severe apnea on the first test and never were treated. Here's patients who had uh, no apnea on the first test. This is the survival rate. So in 20 years, 
look what a difference in the survival rates between the people who were treated, um, who didn't have apnea, and who, who, who did have severe apnea, and you can see the moderate in between. And what we talk to the physicians about, and I use the patients a lot as well, is that, you know, CPAP, if they're not wearing their CPAP every night, all night long, we may not be accomplishing our goal here of having our patients live live longer. And uh, there we go, I got those numbers there, I forgot I had them there. Uh, and then if they kind of push back on that, uh, we can pull out of our <laughs> our arrow here uh, with the little, little known journal called the New England Journal of Medicine. I guess it's, you know, probably a little more published than the Braden and Herald that I just showed you a little while ago, sarcastically speaking. They they did a study on over 2,600 patients. And That's I, a big I have a study. Big study came out a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago almost now. And the goal was we give CPAP to non non um, symptomatic patients who have moderate to severe apnea, who have already had a heart attack or some sort of cardiovascular incidents. We do it all the time. Insurance pays for it. And what does the doctors tell them? Why they say here, where's the CPAP? But doctor, I don't, have, I don't, I'm not tired. I don't snore. What do they tell them, Rich? Wear it anyway. It's going to make you live longer. It's going to prevent yeah. a heart attack. Well, this study studied that because some of the patients didn't wear the CPAP, and some of them did. And what the what the conclusion was that CPAP did not significantly reduce the occurrence of serious cardiovascular incidents, in, events rather, and non-sleepy patients with moderate to severe apnea. And the reason why not, we believe, and you can kind of back into, but you can't say assuredly, uh, is because they didn't wear it much. And the compliance on that study was about 3.3 hours. Now, what's funny, if you go back, and you're not supposed to do some studies, but if you go back and rescore it for four hours of night, there was a reduction. So that's when our patients aren't wearing our CPAP. That's back to your blood pressure medicine being taken uh, uh, a part of the time, Rich, <laughs> you know, I, I like that analogy. And that's mm -hmm. where the AADSM uh, came up here with this uh, 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 mean disease alleviation calculation that um, that you, uh, that dental devices and CPAP are probably equal because of that effectiveness versus compliance that we started out uh, the conversation with. So. Uh, let me go on here. I think I don't, that is for now. There. No, again, again, that goes back to guy. You know, the mean disease alleviation. I, I, I like to talk about that with physicians too because a lot of them get that. I, you know, they, they do. You know, we're just trying to get rid of. You know, every time that patient has an apnea or a hypopnea, they're getting a little squirt of adrenaline. We're increasing sympathetic tone. We just go down a nasty road that's not good. So, you, you know, the the. You, in the big picture out there too, what I feel like I'm trying to do, Guy, it, especially with the sleep physician, when we do lunch and learns, I need to get them to see that it's okay that we take an AHI from 50 down to 12. Right, right. right. And, and But it's yep. all part of what we're doing. And then the, I have on here, we actually have this printed out. It's called the Dental Sleep Solutions Experience. It's essentially what we do from consultation to follow-up to titration or what people are calling calibrations now of home sleep tests to managing their side effects to six-month recall. It's not just here's your device, good luck to you. And uh, whether you verbally go over this with the physicians, whether you hand them a piece of paper or both, they need to understand because what their perception often is, it is just handing them this piece of acrylic, that this is a therapy, it's a procedure, it takes several months to do. And they need to, to be patient with getting the results to them and also understand that it's a lot of work on our part to make this right. And we're dedicated, trained, and willing to do that. But it builds value in what we're doing, especially uh, if it comes down to, to them talking about cost or something like that. They're like, well, you're charging whatever for a you know $300 piece of acrylic. So uh, having a way to articulate that's imp important. Uh, I think the bottom line is before I leave, I always try to, you know, assure them, give them a firm head, handshake, him or her, and look in the eye and say, look, here's what I can promise you. If you send me a patient, we're going to do our very best to look at them and see if they're a good candidate, treat them with the, you know, the highest level of service, and they are going to thank you for sending them to me. They're going to come back and say, my gosh, that's a great office. I, I really appreciate you sending me that. 
And whether they say yes to treatment or no, whether they're a good candidate or not, whether we go forward or not, they're going to receive correspondence from me. If we begin treatment, they're going to receive continued response, uh, a correspondence. So those are two things, doctor, that I can assure you will happen if you send me a, a patient, if you have a patient that you think might benefit, I'd rather say it this way, the first way I just said it, don't do that, that could benefit from having their airway open with a dental device from our services. Put it in the, in, in the terms of what benefits the patient, not what benefits uh, 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 me. And uh, I, wanna, I, I wanna add to that too, Guy. I wanna add to that, uh, that think about yourself when you make a referral. If as a dentist, you made a referral to a guy that does root canals and he charges $20,000 to do a root canal and he doesn't take insurance and he's a jerk on top of that, you know, you, w w human nature is that we don't want to be embarrassed or we don't, you know, we want our patients to think the most of us. So I think what you said is good there because it helps, you've lowered the barrier for that physician making a referral to you when you tell him, hey, your patients are gonna come back and thank you. They're right. not gonna come back and say, you know, that's one thing I ask, guy, because you know, I do this and this is all I do. So when I go into these offices, I go, well, what, how do you typically handle these patients who can't deal with SUPAP? Oh, we just tell them to go see their dentist. How is that working out for you? <laughs> well, not, not very good, you know, because one of them wanted to charge $9,000 and the other one said, you no, know, and we already know that insurance doesn't cover the dental, devi the dental device. And I'm like, well, ho hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, so again, it starts that conversation where you're doing that, but you're, you're absolutely right here, guy. This is, this is what they ask. You know, how much does it cost? It's the same questions our patients ask, you know? How much does it cost? What does my insurance cover? And, and I think what most of us as dentists simply do not understand is how you deal with medical insurance probably dictates as much about how many referrals you'll get as how you actually treat the patient. Because I had a guy say, you know, most of my patients can't pay their $17 copay for their in insulin um, medication. How am I going to send them to you and you charge them $3,000 for a dental device? Well, you got to have an answer for that. So, I, I, you know, I suggest that you guys do some role playing in your office. You come up with a lot of these kinds of questions. You guys, as if you dentists are looking at this, um, you can get this on our YouTube channel and you can play this. It might be a great staff uh, lunch thing where you just play this webinar and, and it, it will generate, you know, have somebody say, asking these questions and, you know, you can do some role playing and things like that. Yeah. So again, that's a good point. We do record all these that are on YouTube forward slash dental sleep solutions and you can watch this. Oh, well, Kelly is so wonderful. Uh, she is out of town uh, on a, a day vacation. Usually she has it the next day, but by the end of the week, I'm confident that'll be on her on our YouTube page. Uh, I don't know if you answered this because I might have uh, been looking at some of the questions down here, but the most common question is how much does this cost? And my answer to the, to the physician is, look, uh, it depends on their insurance and their ability to pay and what maybe, you know, which device we're doing even. So, but what we will do is we'll see your patients for a free consultation. You're gonna get correspondence regardless, and we're gonna do everything we can to make it affordable to them uh, and working with their insurance uh, if they're a good candidate for a dental device. I think that's really, really uh, important to, uh, uh, to, to say. Do not, do not, do not, do not tell them how much you charge for this. Four times. I st started to stop at three, but I thought I'd add one more in there. I mean, even if you only charge $600 for this, there's a physician out there who thinks that's too much. So I don't recommend you giving your fees to the physician. Uh, if they really push you, then you can use what Rich did. Will you tell me how you turned it around on them at the time? What did you tell them? Yeah, I was a cardiologist guy. <laughs> and he goes, I love the story. He picks it up and he goes, how much you charge for these things? And I go, <laughs> can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah. I said, how much you charge for a heart cath? He turned around and looked at me and he goes, well, it depends. And I go, that's my answer. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, so there, there you have that. And you're, goes, we're going to get along just fine. You know, <laughs> so he took my hand and that was it. That was the whole lunch and learn.
He only referred right. me 50 patients, you know, the next year. So we're going to be finished right around. Yeah, sometimes time that's how simple it is. So keep that in your back pocket if you need it. The two keys to the success, I believe, and there's more than two keys, but these are the big keys, is when they send a new uh, a, a new referral source. I've I've done the launch and learn. We've we've We've, we've, we've beat their door down to get through there. We, everything went well. We went to Publix down here in Florida and bought the sandwiches, and we showed up, and we did all this work. And then the patient comes, and I've assured them they're going to be happy they came in. I am going to do everything I can to treat that patient, not only in customer service, but in, in financially. If I have to take a hit on it, and their insurance has a big deductible, uh, I've had to accept assignment if it's a Medicare patient, whatever I've got to do. If I, I've treated patients for almost free. It's the first one that comes from a physician's office because I want that patient to go back and be a raving fan of what we do. And we treat them well. We send all the correspondence that we need to do. And then we call the physician afterwards. Uh, you can call them at first to thank them. But you send them. I like to send them a thank you letter at the beginning, treat the patient, and then call them at the end and say, hey, you got all my correspondence. How'd we do? Thank you again. What more can I do better in the future? And if there's something he or she, she suggests, then then by all means try to implement that. Usually the conversation is, oh my gosh, no, this was great. The patient seems thrilled. Thank you. You'll be seeing more from me. So and then after we do all these things and we get get one hooked, <laughs> we get someone referring to us, you've got to stay in front of them. You've got to keep providing quality and consistent communication. I ideally like to see physicians three to four times a year. Truthfully, we probably get there twice a year with some of them. Uh, certainly no more than once a year that I want myself or someone from our office needs to walk in. Uh, we, we we're pretty good about every three to four months. It's not always me. We drop new brochures by and just stay in front of them, keeping in touch being the, the key and then the communication. I think we've, we've hammered that. You've got to keep going for this. You've got to persevere. Uh, you know, you don't, you know, I hope the first root canal you ever did went great, but it might not have. Uh, you got to stick with it. You will learn how to do this. You will, you will get through the challenges. Uh, if you just realize, if you make up your mind, you're going to do this, you and your team, then you'll do it. It's just, it's just that simple. Um, uh, don't, you don't know, feel like you've got to catch a bunch of fish the first time. Um, uh, Rich and I both like to fish. And what I found out about fishing is you can fish a long time and catch nothing. Move here, move there, move the other way. And then all of a sudden you find where they are and you catch a bunch. And if you find one physician who gets it, they can, it can be like finding the, fish, the, the, the honey hole when you're fishing. You, they can get you a ton of patients just from one physician or one physician's group. It's not like you need 30 referral sources referring you you know, one patient every week or every other week. You need one or two or however many, uh, but not a ton. And you can really, uh, really get to where you need to go uh, because one person can send you a lot. Now, if you want to figure out how to get this done and how to get to where you want to be, so your desired state as we have it here. For those of you who don't know what a gap analysis is, you look at where you are and you look at where you want to go. And if you have been listening to our webinars in the past and uh, I, I challenge any of you right now who've been listening to us for more than six months or, or a year and say, where was I a year ago? Mm -hmm. Okay. Where did I want to be today? Am I there? And hopefully you are, and hopefully through our help you are, but maybe, maybe you aren't. And if you're not, then that's okay. We don't have a time machine. Rich and I haven't invented that yet. Uh, let's give us a little time. Nathan may be able to make that in a spare time, but for now we don't have one. So we need to go forward and say, where do you want to be in six months or a year from now? What needs to change in order for me to make that happen? Identify those factors and then make an action plan for that. You know, Rich, uh, we do some really high-end consulting with some of our members. We we have, you know, our DS3 membership, we, we provide a lot, but then for some of the, the more advanced clients that really want more help, this is what we do for them. We sit down and we look at where they are, look where they want to be, look what needs to change, and we make an action plan. And then you need to make people accountable, including yourself, for that action plan with time associated with. By this date, I intend on doing that. Uh, if you look at all we've accomplished, I was so proud of us at the ADSM meeting. I mean, just people coming up saying, wow, what you've accomplished in the last five years. 
this is how we accomplished it. We sat down, decided where we want to go, and decided what needs to be done. And we're always analyzing it. We can help you with this if that's what you want. If you want to do the dental sleep and get to a place, I promise you, for a cost of of uh, of, of under uh, what thirty five hundred a year we have in this slide, uh, uh, six hundred a year, we can get you far further down the road of dental sleep than trying to do this by yourselves. Uh, if you want to recreate the will, God love you, go ahead and, and do it. But Rich and I have got, you know, what, over 20 years working on this between us, trying to, to, to find out ways to make this more efficient. And look what a financial income impact it can have. If you just do one device a month, one a month, you found two people found you patients in Ubers, you know, this weekend, but you do one a month, you're going to get near $20,000 uh, a year added to your bottom end line, even if you pay a third party builder. Here in Florida, you can take your kids to Disney for a day, maybe two, with, with that kind of cash, you know, 20 grand. It's expensive. Nichols has been bugging me to go to Disney. I'm sorry. Maybe that's on my head. I, got, I have a 12 year old, but he wants to go up to, to Universal, actually. But you do one a week and you're pushing six six figures here uh, into, your, into your practice. There's nothing you can do as a dentist. Uh, to add a service to your practice that has a more of a financial impact than dental sleep. That's all we do at DS3. What we do is help you plan, and we have the plan for uh, accomplishing dental sleep. Everything from uh, screening, testing, treating, and billing, we have the, 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 the four pillars that we help you with through education, coaching, software, and support. Uh, next month, I got to get busy. We're going to be talking about technology so it's again eight o'clock tuesday night i'm excited about talking about the new uh mill devices i have a care stream uh scanner that that i got because you've been using one i have a cbct we're talking to some of our other friends who have other technologies and uh that's going to be um i think a, a yeah, fantastic that's gonna, a, that's gonna be a fun one we've never done that one guy so yeah. I'll, if you need any help i'll just send you a couple of pictures okay Okay, sounds good. If you got anything, please, I'll take all the help I can get. One thing, I, one thing I, I'm confident of after being at the AADSM and walking around to all the booths, we are the only organization, Dental Sleep Solutions and our DS3 system, that has a 360-degree uh, solution to dental sleep. So from beginning to consult to treatment complete to billing to sleep testing to the lab coordination, we help you with all this and if you want to know more about that again just type in consult and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have i know there's some questions that were kind of not related to the, tonight's topic i think they tried to answer them on here but if you want more details just by all means uh type in consult and it's not it's a no pressure uh truly interactive consultation you'll have and i promise you'll feel like the time was well spent uh just let us know and again of those courses you got to type in course even if you didn't see a course in the area you wanted to, go ahead and type it in if you're interested in knowing the ones that we're, we're coming up with. I know we're, we've all but finalized one in Michigan uh, in the fall, and we're working on a couple other ones. So there's other ones coming up. So just type course if you think you want uh, any, uh, any of the two-day course we talked about. And then here's something for free uh, for the last slide. Um, Rich, I liked your article last, uh, last month. I think we're over 30 issues now, 30-something of this. I'm yeah. fairly confident. A lot of, lot of great practical information, you know, and you get that for free. Just email us, you know, and we can we can set up the link to do that. Or you can go to uh, dentalsleepinsider.com and sign up yourself. And it, if you go there, too, you can actually have access to all the back issues. And these are videos. It's a digital magazine. comes right to your inbox. doesn't cost you anything. And there's videos and articles that I think you'll find are very – most all of them very practical about challenges that you may face in, uh, in a dental sleep practice. So look at that, Rich. A little, little after, but not too bad for us. I think we no. finished on time. I, I can tell, man, our team, we've got, you, you should see our, our MSC room. It's like a big call center with all the, the billing and MSC reps. And I see several of them on here answering these questions. So it uh, looks like They've just done a fantastic job. I mean, they they yeah. make our job easy, don't they? they? Is there any questions on here they didn't answer? I, I'm going to pull this open and look. But no, it looks, looks pretty is. good. You know, this is a hard topic to ask a question about, Guy, you know, yeah. because, you know, some of this stuff, I love the idea of you guys getting uh, the YouTube channel 
and playing this at a staff meeting because yeah. I, I really think your staff will come up with some interesting ideas and things and then you can you know it, it just kind of stirs the pot so to speak so that you, you you just get out there and you're doing more of this and you know above all else you know be confident and persevere uh, it is a numbers game but you know keep keep forging that path i believe that the dental devices uh, should have 50 percent of the market share for the treatment of sleep apnea in this country and we only have about four percent right now so we have a long way to go and they're, we got to start breaking down, you know, what the physicians know and don't know and making this whole thing happen. And we're the ones kind of forging the pathway right now. So, uh, Guy, thank you and uh, Jason for putting together another uh, fantastic PowerPoint, as always. And thank you guys for uh, spending some time with us. Yeah, and uh, there's our contact. If you write that down. Uh, feel free to contact with any of your dental sleep questions. Uh, of course, our members know they can get in touch with us uh, anytime Monday through Friday, 8 to 6 Eastern. Uh, but if you're not a member and you still have a question, uh, we're happy to help you. Uh, just answer if, uh, if you're in a, in a bind. That's what we do. Uh, that's what we get up to go to work for. And um, it's really becoming rewarding because I'm starting to hear more and more stories about how we've changed uh, dental practices and was ultimately uh, those practices, patients' lives. So. Thanks for everybody. I know it's busy. I know there's things going on that you could have spent your time on, and thanks for spending it with us. And we'll see you next time. I think we got all the questions there, right, Rich? We got them. All right. Well, thanks, let me guys. see if I can figure have out how to shut this off. Good night. Thanks, Rich. All right.